mobile device. Bring it in, drop it on every desk in your teachers or for your students, and miracles will occur. <laughs> right? Why do I see so much skepticism? <laughs> you know, I, I thought you'd just all pounce on this, and I could just go have a drink, and that'd be it, right? <laughs> no, of course not. Miracles don't occur. Miracles don't occur with this device now. Miracles don't occur with any of these devices, no matter how pretty they are, no matter how wonderful they are. And they didn't occur back in the 80s and back in the 90s when I started looking at this question and saying, well, okay, uh, geez, miracles don't occur, but sometimes remarkable things do happen. I mean, I could look at the work of Seymour Papert, for instance, and actually see it in person, and yeah, things did happen. But just dropping a big box on people's desk meant that people had less desk space, and that was it. So. What did make a difference? Well, that's what I worked on, and that's where the SAMR model came from. And the SAMR model says, look, it's not dropping the nicest box or the nicest software on people's desk that makes a difference. What makes a difference is the intersection between how you're using that nice shiny box and how this is changing what you were doing before, how the uses of that new technology relate to what you were doing before. So a SAMR model has four levels, substitution, augmentation, modification, redefinition, hence the name, very inspired, I know, thank you. Uh, so each level corresponds to progressively greater impact in terms of outcomes for students. Substitution, you're using the technology to do exactly the same thing you were doing before in exactly the same way. This may be great, maybe save you some money, but it doesn't really change student outcomes. It can, however, set the stage for the upper levels. So at the augmentation level, you say, wait a second, the new technology has new affordances that allow me to specialize, particularize, change a little bit how I'm doing tests so they are better suited to students, a little more efficient, a little more effective. I still leave the tasks the same, but how I'm doing them is changing. And now I start to see some improvements in student outcomes. So these two first levels are the enhancement levels with you know, nearly no change in student outcomes or very small changes. However, I can go further and say, well, okay, Let's go to where we really do start to see big impact on student outcomes. And then you get to the two transformation levels, which are modification and redefinition. At the modification level, you're saying, OK, hold on. These tasks that I was doing before were good. They were great. They worked for me. But now the technology allows me to modify, to significantly redesign, change aspects of them, not just how they're doing, but significantly expand their range, get deeper into aspects in ways I could never have done before without the technology. And now I do start to see, at this level, the modification level, significant improvements in student outcomes. I'll come back to that significant in just a bit later. And finally, you can go one step further. At the redefinition level, you say, well, OK, you know what? The technology allows for the creation of new tasks I could previously not have conceived of, period. That will allow me to achieve better goals, deeper goals, a broader spectrum of goals I could never have accomplished before. And these new tasks will replace, in part or in whole, the old tasks, and now I start to see dramatic improvements in student outcomes, and that takes me to the redefinition level. Okay, that's the model in a nutshell. It's easier to see it when you look at a concrete example. So let's look at just that. Let's take an example from history. For instance, I'm teaching a class on the Industrial Revolution, and I want the class to be more than just, okay, everybody memorize uh, where the steam engine was developed and so on. I want my kids to be historians. I want them to grapple with the tough questions that historians are grappling with today about the Industrial Revolution. Why? How? What mattered more? Why was it here at this time and not there at that time? I want to be historians. Good. So at the substitution level, I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to replace that old textbook. Bye-bye, old textbook. I'm going to have the kids say, hey, what are you guys interested in? One of them is going to be interested in technology. Another one is going to be interested maybe in arts. A third one is going to be interested in social conditions. And so on. I say, good. We're going to have a few core texts that everybody's going to read to have some points that are touchstones. But I'm also going to give them the option to pick real books, not just these summary textbooks that really don't give you an idea of what it's like to be a historian. And of course, they're going to be in digital format, so they can be highlighted, annotated, etc., just like you would a traditional textbook. This is great. It sets the stage for what's to come later. But in and of itself, if I just stopped here, I would see nearly no improvement in student outcomes. OK, so that's substitution. Replace the textbook with the paper books, with digital books, with exact one-to-one -one match. At the augmentation level, I say, OK, remember, I want my students to be historians. So I want them to be looking at this and integrating things via maps, via timelines, because they have to integrate where things occurred, when things occurred. Now, if I had the traditional textbook, all the maps and all the timelines would be made for them. I don't want to do that. 
I want them to make these for themselves because they are making meaning for themselves. So they're using these tools to integrate knowledge. So I have them make digital maps and digital timelines, but not just an exact map or an exact timeline, just like the one that used to be in the text. So I say, hold on. Because these are digital, they can also be hyperlinked to other resources. They can contain other media, so you can integrate different types of media. You can do things like turn layers on or off. So for instance, in the timeline, I could have different timelines, one for arts, one for uh, social changes in legislation, one for patents, one for technology, and by turning them off or on, start to see patterns that I could never have seen with a paper timeline. So now I'm going beyond what I could have done with the traditional paper timeline, paper map. The, uh, the affordances of the technology allow me to fun uh, functionally improve what I was doing before to really get at things I couldn't have before. The task is still the same. Make a map, make a timeline, but there are significant improvements that are made possible by the technology. Wonderful, let's keep going. Modification level, now I've got the students working on each of their own individual projects that reflects their interests, where they're coming into this story, how they are thinking about the Industrial Revolution as historians, and I say, all right, as you go along, I want you writing small essays. Now, this is something I would have done anyway, you know, if I'm teaching the history class, have students write periodically small essays so as to have them sort of regroup their thinking about their knowledge, but also so I can keep track of what's going on, and that's all wonderful and good. But I'm going to say, I don't want just those essays that you just used to turn into me. I was just write the essay, turn it to teacher, teacher writes some comments, provides some feedback, goes back, that's it. I say, no, no, no. Let's keep the heart of the task, writing those uh, small essays periodically there, but I'm going to make significant modifications to it that allow me to achieve new goals, courtesy of the technology. So I'm going to ask the students to post their work to blogs, not just so I can read them electronically. If, that, if I'm still the only person reading it, it's straight substitution, folks, okay? No changes there. I want them to post to blogs so they can be reading each other's work, so they can be commenting on it. I say, when you're done writing, you're not done. I want you to be reading some of your fellow students' blogs. How do you pick? We'll get to that in a second. And I want you to be commenting on them. I want you to engage. I say, I agree with you because of X, Y, and Z. I disagree with you because of this. Can you explain this? I don't get this. So you have then to respond to that to get a real dialogue so that these little essays are not just remaining between me and the students, but actually become the basis for a social dialogue for both a social reading and a social writing process. But I said I also want to talk about how they pick who to interact with. Now, I could say, okay, I'll say, you go with these four people and you read these four, but let's make this an experience in and of itself of research, because the technology allows me to do something else along this line of significantly redesigning the task of writing these essays. I can use a concept map, after all, digital concept map can be used as a navigation tool, so that the students can say, well, where am I in terms of what I'm investigating about the Industrial Revolution, and they can see who has topics connected to theirs, that's the logical place to start looking for who you're having a dialogue with. So that the student who's writing, for instance, about artists and art and what they're painting about social conditions is going to say, hey, here's the person that's doing something about research into the legislation around social conditions. Maybe we should be talking to each other. Maybe we should be reading each other's work. So now I'm at the modification level. The task, at its heart, is the same I had before, but there has been significant redesign that allows me to accomplish goals I could not have before in deeper fashion than I could have before by integrating this social aspect and integrating this aspect of cognitive exploration of the landscape of the topic by the students in the process of setting up their social network. Go to redefinition. Traditionally, I would have had the students write a big essay at the end of this. I love writing. Writing is great. Writing is powerful. We need to get our students to write more in different ways, but here's a problem. When we ask students to write the same essay style for every class they take, we bureaucratize writing. So I'm going to move away from that. I still want them summarizing, creating something that encompasses all that they've read, everything they were thinking about in those many essays, and says, here's my summation of my understanding. But instead of asking them to put together an essay, I'm going to ask them instead to put together a digital storytelling piece. I'm going to ask them to make it powerful to engage using every bit of what digital storytelling, in this case, digital video, can do. I don't want a bulleted list, hi, this is my presentation on the Industrial Revolution. Click. Here's a kitten to make you smile so you won't give me an F. Click. And so on. 
No, I want something that really gets into image, audio, sound, music, montage, everything, all the richness that's available there in video. And that's what they use to make a rigorous, critical, analytic argument about what they've understood of the Industrial Revolution. This is a new task. I could not have done it without the technology. And it allows me to still get those aspects of summarize, show me what you've understood, convey it to others. But it also goes deeper than that. It goes beyond that because it gets the students to start thinking across media to see how to engage other media in a rigorous, deep argument. And this puts me then at the redefinition level. Now, this is an example of how you use these four levels of SAMR to guide a design process, what I call a SAMR ladder that starts out at the substitution level, but eventually gets you up to the redefinition level. And notice something interesting. When you do things this way, there's no throwing away. There's not, well, you did that last year, but now it's useless, so we're just going to throw it away. Rather, you build up. So maybe a teacher in a given year would say, well, I'm just going to go to substitution and maybe augmentation, just so I can get the hang of this. And then next year, I'll build up the upper levels, and that's good. That's great. That works fine. In other words, you've got to give people the time, the space to experiment. My experience is it can take, in many cases, two to three years for, a, for the majority of uh, it, the faculty of a school that's bent upon change to really make it to the upper levels. And again, that's fine if that's what it takes. But you want to be thinking about then how you build up to those levels. All right. So we have that. And then we say, all right. I told you that about the difference in gains between, say, augmentation and modification. Let's put some numbers on this. So I have here from two studies, one which is a classical uh, S2A level, so in the lower levels, and another one which is in A to M, which is in the, now making it into the upper levels. The first one de dealing with the teaching of algebra, the second one dealing with the teaching of earth sciences. What do we mean by the difference between these? Well, let, let me give you a little bit of the context. The algebra one was based around having tools that allow you to do some drilling, some standard exercises. OK, straight substitution, nothing new there. And at the augmentation level, some tools for basic visualization. And then the questions that students got were moderately adapted to their progress. By moderately adapted, I mean these weren't new questions. It was just the order and when they got them was, was adapted to the students' progress and difficulty. So that gets you, again, they were still doing the same task they were doing before, but the technology was indeed in some ways used to better adapt to a particular student needs and so on. Uh, for the other case, we had interactive tools being used at the augmentation level. This was a student studying earth sciences, planetary sciences. So they were doing things like interactive tools for moving the earth around the sun, the moon around the earth, and then figuring out why eclipses happen and when, and other features like the tides and so on. But at the modification level, more interestingly, they were asked to create a narrative animation using these tools as their final project. So it wasn't truly going up to redefinition. It was still somewhat templated in such a way that it was more a modification of an earlier uh, practice rather than a complete redefinition or creation of a new practice. So it was at the modification level. But nonetheless, this did push into the domain of how to use digital storytelling to get at these upper levels. What's the difference in effect size? For the first case, where we were sticking no further up the ladder than about augmentation, we got an effect size 0.2, which is respectable, equivalent of taking students from the 50th percentile to the 58th percentile. For the second case, however, we get an effect size of 0.6, which is the equivalent of taking students from the 50th percentile to the 73rd percentile. Those numbers are representative. There's one more number that I have very little data on, but I still want to show it to you. If we retested the kids from the Earth Science class a month later, we found that the effect size went up to 1.4, which means there was a longitudinal effect of how much of this knowledge stayed with them that was the equivalent of taking them from the 50th percentile to the 92nd percentile. I, don't, I can't tell you that this type of Persistence effect, shall we say, or amplification over time effect always exists, but it definitely did in this case, and I think it's worth looking for. So that's what I mean by the difference between the lower levels of SAMR and the upper levels of SAMR in terms of the magnitude of effect you can expect. Now, what else do you need? Well, SAMR tells you how you use the technology relative to what you were doing before, how to plan your use, but there are two more elements that you need to be thinking about. The first one is the question of what tools do you need? And is it enough to just have a nice office suite? 
and that's it. Now, it turns out, and this is based upon the work of the Horizon Project, that for the most part, you see the richest results when you have tools that fall into these five categories available to teachers and students. That doesn't mean that all of these tools are used all the time from the very start, but it does mean that having the availability of them for different projects does seem to give you the basis you need for innovation. And very quickly, the five categories are social tools, those tools that we use to create jointly, to share what we created jointly, to discuss what we created, etc. Mobility tools, which are the tools that say, hey, I have this device, it's not stuck to a desk, I can take it out into the world, I can use it to capture data about the world, I can use it to put data about the world into the world, I can use it any time, any place. Visualization tools, which are the tools that allow me to take an abstract concept and by representing it in two, or in some cases three dimensions, make it more tangible and make it more readily available, more readily understandable for manipulation by a student or by a teacher. And here, of course, we have a whole range of visualization tools, but in particular, five categories are particularly important. So you've already seen several of them. Visualization of space, we call those maps. Visualization of time, we call those timelines. And then we also saw visualizations of how concepts are connected or other things are connected, concept maps, network diagrams, if you will. But we also have, of course, all the traditional visualizations of numerical data, so graphs, charts, plots, etc. although we've seen a huge increase in how we can look at this using uh, computer technologies, as well as interactive forms of these. And finally, tools like a Wordle, for instance, for visualizing textual data. These are also important. Then we have the tools for digital storytelling, all the tools that we can use to bring together, as I was saying, image, text, audio, video, etc., in different ways to tell stories. And the important thing here is that when a student is telling a story, they're making meaning for others, of course, but even more importantly, in the process of constructing a story using these tools, they're making meaning for themselves. And finally, educational gaming. And educational gaming corresponds to, of course, all those tools where we either use games themselves to introduce an idea, a concept, a process into the classroom, or where we take ideas off from the world of gaming, what's sometimes called gamification, although I have to be honest with you, I don't really like the term. Uh, but I, I just like to say we take ideas from how games work and adapt them then to how we do our work using the technology so that we can better inform and enrich the process in the classroom. So these five categories, no, you're not going to use all five of them on a single project, but it's worthwhile making sure that you have some aspects of all five of them available on the tools you make available to faculty and to students. In addition to that then, so we have the tool set, we have summer wells that we need, well we also need to think about how does content knowledge, pedagogical knowledge and technological knowledge interact in the creation of new units of instruction. And this is the TPAC model which was created by Punya Mishra and Matt Kohler. And what the, uh, what the TPAC model says is, look, when you're creating a new unit of instruction to get the maximum result, to get the best results, you need to be thinking about all three areas at the same time, content knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, technological knowledge. But you also need to be thinking about the intersections. So for instance, pedagogical content knowledge, which is when you say, how is a specific pedagogy adapted to the teaching of this particular content area? technological pedagogical knowledge, which is how does this technology make this pedagogical approach possible, technological content knowledge, TCK, which is when you're saying how is this content area being transformed by the introduction of technology, how is it different to be a practitioner in this content area today than it was before the introduction of technology, and finally TPCK, we are thinking how do all of these four things come together to give me a whole. So how do these things interact then with SAMR? Well, let me show you something from some of my more recent work, a metaphor, if you will, for thinking about how TPAC and SAMR interact with each other. And the metaphor works like this. The metaphor works by saying, suppose that you have a valley. Let's think of the world of education and what we do in the classroom as a valley. The teachers, the students are all explorers. We're nomads, we're foragers in this valley, and the deeper the valley, the richer the soil, the richer the soil, the more food to be gained from it. So we're all exploring this valley. At the substitution level, we're staying in the same place in the valley. It's great, we know it, it's well worn, there are no stones to trip us over. We know how to get from point A to point B, but it's always the same food. Nothing new happened there. 
And you'll notice that I don't have anything shaded in then on TPEC because we're actually not making heavy demands other than make sure you don't, shall we say, break the technology pretty much in terms of what you're doing. But when we go to augmentation, now we're beginning to get to places in the valley where we say, well, I can see that that valley is a little bit deeper next door. I just couldn't quite get there yet. And now you're making this type of change. And this type of change where you go to the valley that you can immediately see next door, where the valley is what's given to you by the fact that the technology allows you to do things a little bit more effectively, a little bit more efficient, a little bit more focused on something, requires that you start thinking about specific elements in individual pedagogical knowledge content elements or knowledge content area elements or technological elements. In other words, you're not thinking yet at the augmentation level too much about the integration of these. But of course, there are even deeper valleys that lie beyond where you can see immediately. You can say, well, I don't see over the edge like I could there. But here I can see a trend. Because there's a deeper valley going through this ridge, little you know, mini ridge over here, I'm going to guess that there's another one following in the same direction that's an even deeper valley over this other place that now I, would, I can't see over, but if I have the right tools, I can get over this. And that's when you're at the modification level. And to think about what type of redesign is involved at the modification level to make it successful, to make it effective, you want to be thinking in terms of the TPAC model about these three intersection areas, PCK, TPK, and TCK, as I mentioned before. And in particular, I have to tell you from my research, the crucial one, the most crucial one of the three is PCK, pedagogical content knowledge. As Schulman identified it uh, back in the 80s, this area, when you're thinking about how do I think about which tasks I want to redesign, how I want to redesign them, why I want to redesign them, tends to be very frequently aligned with PCK as the key element, the key place that you want to be thinking about how you're going to do this. Finally, we go to, well, we've run out of trend. At this point, I need to take a sideways step. I need to do something new. I'm not following the series of ridges. I'm going in a different direction. I derive my knowledge of where to leap to, so as to make sure I'm not leaping over a cliff and then hanging midair, Wiley Coyote style, before falling. I, I depend upon this by saying, what have I learned from going over these trend ridges? What can I say by integrating the knowledge I have derived from other paths I've followed to find a new path altogether? And that's, of course, when you need from the TPAC model, that integration of all three, you need to see how all of these ridges, all of these trends fit together in that TPAC integration. And that's what takes you to the redefinition level, then, of the SAMR model. So this is the interaction. If you're thinking about how do I get from one place to another, what do I want to be focusing on? You've got the SAMR model to tell you the levels of integration. You've got the uh, model I showed you with those five categories, what I call the EdTech Quintet, to tell you the kind of tools you should have available. And finally here, this tells you at each level, if you're thinking about TPAC and where you need to invest in professional development, in process, in thinking about what's going to happen, which area of TPAC corresponds to which stage or which step of SAM. So we've got all of this together. To close up, I want to show you one last example. And the last example I want to take from the arts. The arts frequently get neglected, and I really like to close with an example from the arts because it's a rich, wonderful area. It shouldn't just be the little side thought in terms of what we do. So there's going to be a summer ladder to have students explore ideas in the art by creating work in the arts. So assume we have students go to a museum. And I send them out, and I send them out so they can capture. They can capture with their camera. They can capture by recording uh, conversations with curators. In other words, they're gathering information. They're gathering data. This is actually, this is not fake, by the way. Anything I show you, I've actually done. This was done uh, from a visit to the Tate Modern Museum. So I have the students go in, capture, gather that data. And they also go out and capture information that's out on the web. What do other people say about these artists that they've seen? You know, this particular exhibit was on modern art, so this student has become fascinated with Delaunay. So they're researching the work of Delaunay. They are a student who's interested in things like rhythm, the connections between math and abstract art. So they're finding both what they collected because of the mobility of these devices. Remember, I was telling about those tools being available. And also because they can go out and socially interact in terms of what others have put out on the web to gather it and to gather us information about this. 
So now at the augmentation level, I'm going to ask them to integrate, to construct knowledge from what they've got. And here I'm using digital timelines to have the students, again, start to see what are the connections between these artists, to see patterns that maybe weren't evident at the museum, to start making sense. I could, of course, have used network diagrams or concept maps or maps. I'm just showing you here an example of how the technology functions at the augmentation level then to allow the students to start constructing this picture for themselves in the arts. But remember, I don't just want the students talking about this. I want them doing. I want them making. Now, here's the thing. I would love for the students to be making things in oil and carving pieces in wood and so on, but those things take time. There's a certain skill level that needs to be attained. I would love the students to, however, be able to create immediately without necessarily having to become experts in oil. And digital craft is somewhat easier to acquire than the physical craft. So at the modification level, I'm going to send the students out and say, now start creating your own work that has to have a dialogue with one of these artists you saw. And remember, I was talking about the student who's interested in Delaunay. So this student is interested in math, in rhythms. So they take their exploration of rhythms in math with all the tools that allow them to visualize rhythms, to create rhythms, and start mapping them on using digital virtual art tools. Here, for instance, a virtual clay tool that allows them to make sculptures that incorporate this. Now, this doesn't mean I abandon the physical world. I love the physical world. In fact, one of the possibilities here is once the students have informed their thinking and their creation with this, to have them create physical objects that are a direct result, a direct progression, a direct, shall we say, achievement that is made possible by what the technology makes possible here. In other words, sometimes the outcome at the upper levels of SAMR of what you can do that is possible because you couldn't have done it without the technology is not necessarily in the world of the technology itself, but it can also be in a physical object that a student could not have undertaken without a previous step due to the technology. But let's keep going for the last one here. Let's assume, however, that for this particular project, I left everything in the digital world. And now at the redefinition level, I want to end as I started because I started with the students going to a museum and a well-curated exhibit it's a story. It's a story about the art. It's a story about how art is connected. It's a story about what it means. So here I'm going to have the students do just that. They're going to curate their own exhibit. This digital storytelling, it's a different form of digital storytelling from video. It's a form of digital storytelling that uses the physical space, a virtual physical space that they can share with others, have others inhabit, have others explore. So I'm going to invite them to tell a story about the artist that fascinates them the most and their own work and the dialogue between those two in this curated space. And I think you'll agree with me that this indeed takes us up to the redefinition level. So that's it. I've tried to give you a brief introduction to SAMR, a couple of additional elements, the EdTech Quintet, and TPAC and how those connect up, and give you a couple of examples to help illustrate how all of these pieces fit together. All of the slides I've just shown you are already available for download from my website, so if you go to hipassus.com, RP weblog, you can download the slides, and you've got my info there, and at this point, I'm ready to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. <laughs>